So this is a very special interaction we've planned for our viewers today with someone uh, who's sitting far away, all the way in New York, in the United States. But over the last 40 years, he has interviewed and researched upon some of the best minds in the world of investing. I'm talking about William Green, who's joining us today on his uh, new book, uh, Richer, Wiser, Happier. This is the copy I'm talking about. And in this book, he has interviewed top investing names, legends, John, Sir John Templeton, Tom Gaynor, Jack Fogel, Nick Sleep, Monish Pavrai, Joel Greenblatt, Bill Miller. In fact, many of them, uh, Howard Marks, uh, uh, many of them have been on ETNR before, so familiar names, so great uh, to have you, William. And thanks so much for agreeing uh, to chat with us on this new book. Thank you, it's, it's lovely to be here with you. Wonderful. So uh, it's it's a very nice, uh, breezy read, very educative people who love to read about investing uh, because it doesn't not only gives insight, but it also talks about personalities behind the legend. Uh, so let's let me start by understanding your thoughts over the years. You have interviewed so many uh, money managers, asset managers, some legends, some ongoing current uh, superstars, if I may say so. What are some of the common traits you have found in them, which makes them, because it's a competitive field we are talking about, uh, some of the common traits which come to mind? I think one of the most striking themes that I found again and again with the greatest investors is that they tend to be very unemotional and very rational. They're looking at the data, at the evidence, at the, at the numbers in a very dispassionate way analyzing things with, with a great attention to probability. They're always thinking, what's my downside risk here? Is the, is the upside greater than the downside? And someone who's a total embodiment of this, I think, is, is Warren Buffett's legendary partner, Charlie Munger, who now is 97 years old and is, is often regarded as even cleverer than Warren Buffett. And I, I went to interview Charlie Munger in Los Angeles, and he, he had bought Wells Fargo Bank at the, the absolute bottom tick in March 2009 during the financial crisis, when the last thing anybody wanted to own was a, a, a company in, in financial services. And I said to him, was it difficult for you to buy when everyone else was panicking and there was so much anxiety? Do you, do you, do you struggle against those emotions? And he said, no, not at all. I, I don't feel it. And, and so I said, so you weren't even really trying to repress those emotions. And he said, no, and Warren is wired exactly the same way. So I think one of the great advantages temperamentally that a lot of the best investors have is that they're, they're wired slightly differently than, than most of us. And so for me, one of the lessons of the, of the reporting all of these years of research that I did was to say, well, am I wired in a way to win this game? Am I wired intellectually, emotionally, to win this game? And, and one of the great characteristics, I think, of many of the, the great investors is to say they'll only play games that they can win. And so, so Buffett will say, well, how, how, how do you beat um, uh, you know, the, the, the Bobby Fischer, the legendary chess player? He said, well, play him at anything but chess. Right, very interesting point. Circle of competence, play the game which you're very confident about. Uh, let's move on and talk about one of the uh, topics which you've touched upon, and that is concentration versus diversification. And Nicholas Sleep is, Nick Sleep uh, and his letters are very famous as well among investing community is something you've spoken about. Now, this is one subject which is also often discussed in investing circles in India. Should we, we have a very concentrated approach to investing big money or do we, you know, just spread our risks over? What are your thoughts there? I think it depends on both your talents and your temperament. So for somebody like Nick Sleep, he basically, he ran this extraordinarily successful hedge fund with his partner, um, Case Zakaria, which beat the market by something like 800 percentage points over 13 years, an astonishing feat. And then they closed the fund, returned something like $3 billion in assets to the shareholders. And they just have invested their own money very, very successfully in recent years. And basically, Nick simply owned three stocks. All he owned was Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon and Costco. And he recently added a fourth stock. And his view was, these are companies where the destination is very clearly excellent. We, we know 
that over the long term they're doing the right things to reach a desirable destination. So he says, I'm happy to own those companies. And he's owned Costco for 18 years and Amazon for 16 years. But I think for somebody like, like me, I have to recognize that I'm not Nick Sleep, I'm not Warren Buffett, I'm not Charlie Munger, and that temperamentally, I simply can't cope with that degree of concentration. And so somebody like Sir John Templeton, who I interviewed in the Bahamas many years ago, spent a day within the Bahamas, who in many ways is regarded as the greatest global stock picker of the 20th century, he warned me that, that really for the average investor, the intelligent thing to do is to own maybe four or five funds that are exposed to different areas of the market. Because he said that over the course of his lifetime, he had made over half a million investment decisions. And as he put it, one third of them were the opposite of wisdom. And so he said, if, if somebody as good as him, who, who, is, who is working extraordinarily intensely and had a real advantage and was a Rhodes Scholar and came top of his class at Yale, if he was making mistakes like that a third of the time, you want to protect against your own fallibility. And so for me, that, that simple piece of advice from him that I should own three, four, five funds and not overestimate myself has been very helpful. I think it's, it's protected me from a fair amount of stupid mistakes over the last 20 years, I hope. Right. Uh, William, you also interviewed Jack Bogle, another legendary investor. In fact, I do remember he was uh, on our channel a couple of years back from Morningstar Conference, and he talks about keeping it simple. Now, there's a very, uh, you know, big surge in ETFs and uh, index funds, etc., happening here in India as well as new investors pile on. Uh, and perhaps keeping it simple would be the message from uh, Sir Jack Bogle and uh, your interaction with him. If you could tell us uh, why is it so important? Yeah, Jack Bogle was a fascinating character who, who, who died a, a year or so ago. Uh, and, and Warren Buffett has said that if there were a statue built for anybody in the investment industry, it should be Bogle because he's done so much to help shareholders. He was, he was really the pioneer of index funds. And, and Vanguard now manages something like $6.2 trillion. It's an extraordinary thing that he launched. But when I interviewed Jack Bogle many years ago, he said to me that really, if if you understand the simple mathematics of investing, you understand the, the importance of expenses, for example, that they eat away at your returns. And so he said, the mathematics were so clear that if you have a middleman, a croupier, as he put it, who's skimming off part of your, part of your profits, it really eats away at any of your returns. So he said, for most people, the default position is just to take a very simple approach where you have a, an index fund that tracks the market at a very low cost. And I found this whole approach of simplicity really ran through a lot of the greatest investors to a surprising degree. So there's, a, there's another great investor that I focused on called Joel Greenblatt, who founded a firm called Gotham Capital. And he had extraordinary returns. He averaged 40% a year for 20 years, which means essentially you turn $1 million into $836 million, which is Quite a, quite a nifty trick that I, I wish I were capable of replicating. And when I asked him what the secret of, of investing was, he said, it's, it's really simple. He said, it, it all boils down to one thing, which is you value an asset and then you buy it for much less than it's worth. And that's an idea that runs through Howard Marks, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett. And I think that's a, that's a very robust and powerful idea that, that comes comes really from Ben Graham originally, who was Warren Buffett's famous teacher. And so I think once you understand the simplicity, the, the, the inviolable principles underlying investing, it provides a, a true north for you so that you're less likely to, to get knocked off course by things that are irrelevant, particularly in times that are faddish or overheated or when other people are panicking. You can come back to these inviolable rules and say, okay, well, I, I know that what I want to do is value a business and buy it for less than it's worth. William, what does your research say about pulling off the idea of cloning? Uh, again, uh, Monish Pabrai is a regular on our channel and a friend of the channel, and he does it brilliantly. Why I'm asking you this question is because here back home in India, there are a lot of superstar investors, which a lot of investors try to emulate. Uh, but some are successful, some are not. In what kind of conditions does cloning work and what are the things 
uh, you learned out of your chat with Moni? Well, I spent an enormous amount of time with Monish, and actually the, the book begins in India because I spent five days with Monish traveling initially from Mumbai to, to, to the territory of Dadra and uh, Naga Haveli, which I have to apologize for my pronunciation, um, to visit a rural school, JNV Silvasa. Because what's really fascinating about Monish is that he's not just a relentless cloner in the markets, he's a relentless cloner in every area of life. And so his charitable foundation, Dakshana, is really a clone of the Super 30 program that this great mathematics teacher, Anand Kumar, set up in Bihar province. And so what, what, what Monish is doing is he's saying, well, in every area of life, there are people who are wiser and cleverer and more experienced than me. Let me, let me figure out what the rules are that, that they've uncovered, what works and then replicate it with, with tremendous attention to detail. And so what he figured out is, well, the greatest players of the investment game, uh, Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger, let me replicate their laws of investing. But I think one of the things that's very tricky is that you have to do it in a way that suits your temperaments and your talents. And so, so Charlie Munger has said that a well-diversified well portfolio could actually just have four stocks. And so, if you're Monish and you have an extraordinary appetite for risk and an incredible temperament, you can have a four stock portfolio. You, I think Monish in recent years had an enormous amount of his, his portfolio in companies like Rain Industries. And I can't do that. I can't cope with it temperamentally. And so Guy Spear, I think, has also been a, a guest on, on your channel many times. Guy says, I just don't have the same, the same level of confidence and, and nerve that Monish has. So Guy shares many of the same positions that Monish has, but they're, they're not as aggressive. And I think that's a really important idea for all of us. You, you, you want to learn from the people who are, are, are better, smarter, more experienced, wiser, but you want to do it in a way that suits your talents and, and, and your skills and, and your appetite for risk. Right, uh, William, in fact, uh, let's move on and touch upon some of the other ideas, not from the how to get richer side, but how to be wiser. An idea you speak about is the idea of delaying instant gratification. Try to move away from short termism. Now here I'm quite surprised because we are talking about multimillionaires, billionaires probably, and still when everything is within their reach, they practice delaying gratification. Yes, I, Charlie Munger, Buffett's partner, says that if, if you weren't born with the delayed gratification gene, it's a tremendous disadvantage in life. And Nick Sleep, who we mentioned before, who ran this fund, Nomad, Nomad with tremendous success, really the core of what he did was all about deferring gratification. So his point is that when you look at the way people invest and the way they live, they're constantly focused on these quick hits of energy, things like checking your, your Twitter news feed or, or, or whether people like you on LinkedIn or Facebook or, or even looking to see whether a company is going to beat its earnings by a penny in the next 12 weeks. And he said, yeah, that's fine, but that, a lot of that information has a very short shelf life. And so what he said is, I want to focus on things with a long shelf life. And so, for example, he would say, let me, let me figure out the ultimate destination for a company like Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway? Is it, a, is it a desirable destination in 10, 15, 20 years? And are they doing the things that are going to get them to that destination? Like, for example, providing more and more value to their customers, be, be, uh, being very efficient in delivery, very low cost, treating their supply as well. And his point is that if you focus on the things that actually matter over the long term, it gives you a tremendous advantage in life. And so he set up his life in this way in, in really extraordinary ways. He, 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 he had this office on the King's Road in London above a, a, a Chinese herb store. It was far away from, from Wall Street, far away from the Mayfair area of London where everyone else is investing. And he just wanted to have this very quiet, very quiet life where he could sit and read and think and go visit companies. And I think this idea is very powerful for, for all of your listeners. But in a world where everyone is being very short term, they're being dinged constantly by their phones and being forced to go to meetings constantly. It's a, really a superpower if you can step back a little bit from the world and say, 
let me focus on things that, that will benefit me over many years, that really have enduring value. And so this idea of, of having an information diet with a long shelf life and, and even focusing on things like saying, well, how, how will I maintain my health into old age? Or how, how to be morbid? Will, will people think of me at my funeral? Will they, right. will, will they talk of me fondly? And so to focus on the long term and then move backwards and say, what are the inputs that I need in order to achieve this desirable goal of being loved by my family, being healthy in, in old age, investing wisely? It's a principle that I think runs through everything in life. That's a powerful idea indeed. Uh, another, uh, you know, chapter which you speak about very fondly and it was very valued interaction of yours was the brief but uh, a very important meeting with Charlie Munger and you traveled quite a lot to reach there because he's so smart and I remember uh, you know a couple of lines which you said you were almost afraid to talk to them talk to, to him because he's so smart he can find flaws in in slightest of things but of course beyond his hard appearing core he's a very soft guy inside and he talks about you just try to be not to be stupid and you and everything else takes care of itself. Elaborate that point which you learned from him. It's a wonderful paradox because Munger is really regarded as one of the smartest people alive. Buffett has said he has the best 30 second mind of anyone alive, that he can he can see the essence of everything before you've even finished your sentence. And so you have this fearsomely clever guy with a reputation for being very brusque and tough, you know, he sees, he sees through idiocy and fakery and pretense very quickly, which is one reason why I was so scared to go meet him. And, um, and yet he focuses systematically on reducing what he calls standard stupidities. And he says that if you focus very heavily on simply trying not to be stupid, it's an enormous advantage in life. And so one of the things that he does, that I think, that I think is a very helpful trick, a mental trick for all of us, is he says, let me picture a dreadful outcome, an appalling outcome, whether as an investor in life, and then let me figure out what the causes of that dreadful outcome were, and then let me avoid it. And so he, he had, a, he had a, a friend named Garrett Hardin, who was a, a famous ecologist, who many years ago used the example of India. And he said, if you, if you want to help India, how would you ruin India? So you ask first, what do you do to ruin a company? What sort of government would ruin it? What, what sort of policies would ruin it? And then, and then you avoid that. And it's, it's the same with investing. So I think a very helpful thing to do is to say, what do the worst investors I know do? You know, they, they trade too often, they're hyperactive, they get very emotional, they get very carried away by um, fads and euphoria. They invest in things that they don't understand. Uh, and, and I think a consistent theme in this book is that the, the greatest investors avoid things that they don't understand. They stay within their circle of competence. They play games that they can win. And there's a great, a great investor from Fidelity, a man called Joel Tillinghast, who, who I went to visit in Boston. And he's beaten the market by just an enormous margin over the last 30 years. And when I went to ask him what his secret was, he basically just listed all of the things he doesn't do. And they included things like not investing in early stage biotech companies, because he said, I simply can't build a good model for what their earnings will be in, in the years to come. And he said, they're so volatile that they're going to make me go crazy. They'll make me very emotional. So he said part of his, part of his success is simply staying away from his own ignorance and emotion. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, let's move on, uh, William. There's a chapter where you touch upon how investing, one needs to be a willingness to go alone. And many of the super investors we speak to here privately say, and who have really made it very big, who have really changed their orbits in decades. They tell me privately that it is a very long and lonely road as well, amassing big wealth. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I, I love that phrase, the willingness to be lonely, which, which someone used many years ago when I, I was talking to him about Sir John Templeton and what Templeton's secret was. And he said, well, if you look at George Soros, who's obviously a very famous multi-billionaire trader, and you look at Buffett and you look at Templeton, he said they all have this willingness to be lonely, to diverge from the crowd and to make their own very independent decisions. And I think one of the greatest examples of this was was this extraordinary bet that Sir John Templeton made 
during World War II, which I interviewed him about. And so if you think about how difficult the period is that we're going through at the moment with COVID, cast your mind back to say 1939, 1940, when Nazi Germany had invaded um, Poland, overrun France, and it really looked like, like the whole of, of Europe was going to fall to the Nazis. And at this, this extraordinary juncture in, in world history, the markets were crashing and everything looked extraordinarily bleak. And Templeton looked at the Wall Street Journal and he picked out 104 companies that were all trading from, for less than a dollar each. And he said, well, I think that if, if things recover, if the world doesn't end, these companies that have been very beaten down are going to perform to an extraordinary degree. They're going to bounce back. And 37 of the companies were actually in bankruptcy and he still bought those. And over the next five years, he quintupled his money. And, and one of the points that he made to me is that partly because of his religious faith, he was a very devout Christian. He said, he said, I never was depressed or despairing. I always assumed that the world would get better. And as, as I write in that chapter, I say, he, he remembered this fundamental truth of life, which is that the sun also rises. And so I think this ability to step away from the crowd, to step away from the mood of, of despair or the mood of over exuberance and think rationally for yourself and think, well, this period is not the same as the next period, just as it's not the same as the last period. And so I need to position myself for the future while also being aware that I can't, can't predict the future. But I need to position myself in a way that, that recognizes that the world is uncertain and that, that good times don't always last, but bad times don't last either. And I, I think that ability to think for yourself independently, independent of the crowd, unemotionally, turns out to be really one of, one of the, the most important traits of great success as an investor. In fact, this particular answer of yours will give a lot of hope to a lot of investors and our viewers who are listening to this conversation. My last question to you is about one side which I've also found common in many of the super investors you've interviewed over the years and many of them I have met over my uh, career uh, for a half decade almost and that is an inclination towards philanthropy. The idea uh, that Manish clearly is, an, is essential but how essential is money? What is the end use? What are your thoughts on your interaction with uh, the people you researched upon on this. Yes, I, I, I write about this in the epilogue of the book because I, I really, I've interviewed some of the most successful people in the world, these people who've really hit the jackpot financially. And so I wanted to figure out, well, what does the money actually do for them? Does it make for a happy life? And, and, and what makes for a truly abundant life? Not just one where you're extremely rich, but where you have great relationships and the like. And I was very struck. I, I, I end the book by writing about a man called Arnold Vandenberg, who's an extraordinary human being who, who was born during the Holocaust as a Jewish kid in hiding during the Holocaust on the same street as Anne Frank. And in many ways, I regard him as having the most successful life of any investor I've met. He's, he's an extraordinary man. And, and when I look at why Arnold is so happy, I think part of it, it's, it's not that he's just had this very good record over 40 years as an investor and become wealthy, I, I see the enormous joy that he takes in sharing with others, in taking care of others, in helping others. And I, I think that's one of the great secrets of life. It's not, it, like, like many great truths in life, it's, it's actually relatively simple. And, and Charlie Munger often says, take a simple idea and take it seriously. And I think when you look at these really successful investors, the ones the ones who worship money and who, who just are trying to accumulate airplanes and, and yachts, fine. I mean, if they enjoy it, lovely. I'm, I'm happy for them. But I think, I think if it's just about the money, it's a very stunted life. And, and so I think part of being more enlightened is to recognize that you want to share your gifts, whether, whether it's your time, your money, your love. And I, I think in some ways, that's why I begin the book in India describing what Manish Pabrai has done, because I think Manish deeply understands this. He's, a, he's an extraordinary investor. He has a wonderful mind. And he has this, uh, this ability to play this game that requires him to, to sit quietly in a room and wait for mispriced bets that he, that he seizes with what Charlie Munger calls gumption. 
but he but he then takes that gift and he uses it to benefit others and i i love the fact that he he in, he intends to become a billionaire i mean he's 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 playing this 30 year game to reverse engineer warren buffett and charlie munger to turn a million dollars into a billion but he actually intends to to end his life with nothing to have given everything away and i maybe monish is quite extreme and not all of us want to go so far but i i think that's a wonderful model it's it's something that i i deeply admire and i i think all of us all of us if we're trying to figure how to win the game of life and not just the game of investing there has to be a deep focus on sharing and on relationships and on helping others in order to have not just a successful life but actually a happy life right no that's uh, that's so true uh, william and i think that's what makes many of them truly rich is that ability to give away what they have actually amassed over the years in a very systematic and efficient manner uh, for, thanks so much william for this very enriching chat and i will strongly recommend all our viewers uh, who like investment and uh, are into reading to go for this book uh, richer wiser happier uh, by william green i thoroughly enjoyed it and i'm sure you guys will also enjoy it William, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Look forward to chatting with you uh, going forward as well. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Right. Thank you so much, uh, William, for this. Uh, I'll just record one answer with you on how to get rich, and then we'll be done. I really enjoyed uh, our chat today. Oh, good. Thank you. So, William, uh, <coughs> what is your mantra of how to get rich? If I were to ask you for our viewers, here in India, you've researched some of the best minds in investing who have found the formula and the secret sauce. Uh, and of course, your own experience, what would uh, your message be to them? How to get rich? I had a fascinating interview a few years ago with a man um, who, who actually lived to 109 years old. And I, I interviewed him a few months before he died. His name was Irving Khan. He's a legendary investor who I think spent 86 years investing in the markets very, very successfully. And I said to him, what's, what's the secret of investing and, and building long-term wealth? Because he, he was the epitome of long-term wealth and endurance, both bi biologically and financially. And he said to me, it all comes down to one word. He said, it all comes down to safety. And he said, you have to focus first on preserving capital, on avoiding catastrophe, so that you stay in the game. And this is something that I've seen in many of the greatest investors, that there's a tremendous focus on, on resilience, on staying in the game for many, many years, for decades, so that, so that you're harnessing the power of long-term compounding. And so someone like Howard Marks, for example, who manages about $120 billion, said to me that the key really is not to overreach. So you're, you're living within your means, you're saving so you have a cushion, so that so that you're not knocked out of the market at the worst time because you're investing borrowed money and then you you panic at the worst moment and have to sell so he says then because you're positioned in this fairly defensive way and, and are able to to stay in the game for a long period then when there's disruption when there's mayhem in the market and other people are panicking you're in a tremendous position to exploit that uncertainty by buying things that are very cheap that are mispriced bets and I, I think that's an extremely powerful approach to position yourself to survive, to focus on being relatively conservative so you stay in the game, so you don't have to go back to zero ever. And then you keep your expenses down, your, your investing expenses, but also your living expenses. And then I think you can't fail to win this game over, over decades. Right. Thank you so much for your time, William. Good luck for your book. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank Bye. you so much. I really enjoyed it. Take Great. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.